Hello, I'm Lee Chantel from VivaLaVegan.net. It's been a while, but I'm creating this video to celebrate the fact that 10 years ago, I put on Brisbane, Australia's first all vegan environmental festival. And it took place on the 13th of March, 2010. We had 3,000 to 4,000 people who attended at the Brisbane City Botanic Gardens. And I wanted to make this video to celebrate the fact that this happened and to think about how far we've come and how far we still have yet to go. So let me tell you a bit about why I decided to put on Green Earth Festival in 2010. Originally the idea was sparked when two of my friends from interstate planted a seed in my head. One of them was my great friend Jessica Bailey who runs a cruelty free shop and she also was the person who started the cruelty free festival which takes place in Sydney. My other friend Kaz, now known as Grace Love, who used to run Bliss Organic Cafe in Adelaide and who created um, the Adelaide Vegan Festival that takes place, I think it's now continuing to be two days per year. Um, and they both had put on events in their successive cities, so Sydney and Adelaide. And they were saying, you need to do something in Brisbane. And um, Grace, Jess and I are all doers. We all come up with an idea, we work out how to do it and we get things done. So I knew that um, it would be a good idea, but at the time I was working on some other things, so I sort of just put it to the side. But it was a good idea and there needed to be something in Brisbane. And um, after this, I'd been to a few events in Brisbane and in Queensland that were specifically focused on the greenwash aspect. So come along, this is our green first, this is our green event, and um, we'll just serve heaps of meat everywhere, or we'll serve everything in plastic, rah rah. So I was a bit annoyed with that, that people weren't actually getting the message of what green or eco actually meant. And another thing that really pushed um, the idea of the festival in Brisbane ahead for me was the fact that I went to a vegan event that was predominantly just for vegans to congratulate themselves about being vegan. So I thought I really need to create something that is non-greenwash and non-preaching to the converted, which I thought was really important. Once I decided I wanted to put on a festival, when I normally decide to do something, I work out, okay, this is what I can do. These are my skill sets. These are the things that are missing. These are the people I know who can do some of these things. And this is all the other stuff that I need. And these are other people that are need for these jobs. So I originally started with my good friend, Darush, and he is involved in a lot of festivals around Australia, music festivals in particular and he became my festival manager. And we met, I met with him and just a couple of other people and we just worked out exactly what was going to happen. And one of the options was to use someone else's public liability to put on the event or to create our own group. I contacted our local Queensland um, vegan, vegetarian and animal rights groups and they either did not want to be involved or did not have the capacity to help out. So I created my own not-for-profit called Green Earth Group. So Green Earth Group became this umbrella and it became the, the name in the group and had all these sort of ideals. So Green Earth was created to encourage people to look after people, to look after each other, to look after our animal friends and to look after the environment. And it was to encourage people in a positive, effective way of doing things. So that was sort of the core ideals. So when I talk about this Green Earth Group and the not-for-profit that I was president of and I ran for many years, I really want to point out that I don't suggest you, you create or even run or even be a president of a not-for-profit because it's really, really hard work. 
and um, I recently was president of the Vegetarian Vegan Society of Queensland here in Australia a few years ago and I reminded myself of why I don't want to be involved um, in a large capacity with not-for-profits anymore. It's just hard, hard work. There's a lot of things that you do as a volunteer that you don't get any thanks for, that people always complain about, and people are quite willing to always say things like, oh, you should do this and you should do this and you should do that, but they're not willing to say, hey, it'd be great if you could do this and I can help you do this. I'm good at this, this, this. I can commit to these sort of things on these dates and I want to make this happen with you. They're the people I like. They're the people I like to surround myself with and have involved in anything I'm doing because they're doers and they're not just complainers. So, so anyway. Darush became my festival manager and then we needed to think outside the square and get more people involved. This is back in 2009 when Facebook didn't have all the algorithms it has and didn't have all the control over what you see and how you see it and things like that. So we did some Facebook advertising and actually went to some really good people and who it was meant to and the money when you know you used to do, when you were able to do advertising online and it was actually effective. So that was how we originally got quite a few people involved in Green Earth Group. And from that, we had regular meetings at Loving Hut, which is a vegan restaurant, and we have one here in Brisbane or Mount Gravatt. So we had regular meetings at least once a month, every few weeks at Loving Hut. And this was really amazing. Anyone who knows me knows I love a brainstorm, knows I love pros and cons, knows I love lists and working out, this is what needs to be done, this is how we'll make it happen. And this is where I was able to express what I wanted and what I thought was needed and where everyone else was able to as well. And I had so many people ask me how we got so many volunteers involved because we had over 100 volunteers involved at the festival. And the reason was we had regular meetings and we invited people to come along and be part of it. But not just divvying out, okay, this needs to be done, this needs to be done. It was, what do you want and how can you help this happen? And I think it's really important not only to lead people and um, help make things happen, but it's really important to listen to other people and to be open-minded to see things in a different way, which Green Earth was really, really a great um, time in my life to be able to listen to people and to learn from different types of people and we had it was really amazing actually we had so many different types of people that were involved in green earth we had people that were still at high school and we had up to grandparents and eight people just gave what they could and put in the time and the energies that they could it was really really cool and anyway with these discussions with people of all ages and these regular meetings and the listening to people and not everyone was vegan not everyone was even vegetarian a few people just wanted to had just moved to the area and wanted to to make some friends or wanted to go into social sort of environments so over time we created a tribe and i call this my green earth vegan tribe or my green earth tribe because this was my time where i was able to bring together people that were of similar mindsets to me and to just make that great team where we all knew what we were trying to do and we were trying to promote something that we all really, really believed in. And because of this, because of this tribe we created, we created a community, it became a community. And this was back in the day where you could, um, you know, disagree with people and people, you know, there'd be some altercations here and there, but generally everyone got along because everyone had a main goal and everyone had all these, you know, smart, measurable, actionable, results orientated, time limited goals. So we had all these goals and they were great. And um, it was really important that we had all this sort of foundation or scaffolding stuff before we got to the big thing. Um, do a Google search for Green Earth Group The History and you can see the free ebook that you can download or you can just have a flick through. It's quite long but there's heaps of photos and it's a really cool way to just see where we came in you know, the five years that we were around.
So Green Earth Group was created to put on a festival. That was the primary goal. And the first festival that we had was Green Earth Festival. It took place at Brisbane City Botanic Gardens on March the 13th, 2010. And it was amazing. The Botanic Gardens are right in the city centre. You could get public transport there. It was green, it was beautiful. It also just happened to be on the same day as St. Patrick's Day. So there were heaps of people already walking around in green. Um, so we um, had a lot of those people come along to our event as well. And it had been raining a week or so before, quite a lot. And on the day, it was a beautiful day, sprinkled for a, a really small amount just at one stage but it was just a beautiful and perfect day it was still one of the best days of my life and it's amazing when you see all your time and your energy and your money and your focus and your um how you've put your your life on hold for a certain amount of time and to actually see something come from it and something really big and something magical something massive and people still talk about it as being an amazing event and one of the best vegan events ever and um that was because we had a lot of volunteers who made it happen and we had so many people we had all these different sections we had a kid zone we had a video zone we had speakers we had a spoken word section we had performers on the main stage we had a hundred different stalls um, the food stalls as well and we had all these little other areas where you could do things like um, do some painting or there was an art um, exhibition type thing as well um, and weaving do some weaving there was just lots of things happening and it was really cool and it was great because it was a free event anyone could attend and it was open for people to learn more we had lots of photos and quotes and things strewn around the area and recycled bits of um, some I think someone's dad's kitchen was being knocked down so we used all the timber and all the um, stuff that goes on top I can't remember what it's called and we just made them into all these pieces and we just put all um, these sayings all these quotes about the environment around and it was just amazing it was such a great day whenever you do a festival people want to know when the next one is so yeah we'll do it same sort of time next year didn't really get much better than that day to be honest um, it was pretty hard to get to the next it was pretty hard to get through the next year um, it was okay until a bit before the festival so you know we were getting sponsorships we we're getting people involved we we're getting some volunteers we were getting uh, you know the all the foundations in place to make this event happen again in March and then in January we had um, a photo shoot with Carol Slater and she was our photographer um, did, took amazing photos and pretty much after that photo shoot we had on the 10th of January it poured it poured down with rain that didn't stop for many many days and um, Queensland, the state that I live in, we're known as the Sunshine State because it's beautiful all the anyway, time. Sunshine State is amazing because it's beautiful weather. Three quarters of our state was declared a disaster zone due to the floods. And these floods took over a lot of people's time and energy and it destroyed a lot of homes, it destroyed a lot of businesses and it destroyed some lives as well. And because of the floods, um, our volunteers were busy with volunteering to be what was known as the Mud Army. Our sponsors were donating their money or giving their money to other places that need it, like flood victims. And our stall holders were worried, you know, why, why would we come to Brisbane or why should we even come to Queensland when there might be another weather catastrophe. Um, and just when it was really, really important to promote veganism and environmental aspects when we had such destruction of our environment is when we weren't able to really make it happen as much as we wanted to. Um, we'd had an intellectual property issue 
and um, we had to change the name from Green Earth Festival to Green Earth Day. So we needed for the second festival, based on what we did for the first year, about 30 grand. The first year I'd, I'd asked for a heap of favours, I'd called in all my favours, I'd um, lots of people put their hand up. The second year it was really hard to get those favours again, to um, do things as much on a budget as we had, um, and we really needed that money to be honest. So we're, I was at a bit of a dilemma. Then Darush, who was my festival manager for the for Green Earth Festival, he gave me a bit of an ultimatum. We had a meeting, I think it was maybe a month before the festival date, and he said, look, you don't even have close to the amount of money you need, you need to work out what's going to happen. You need to either cancel the event, you need to postpone the event, or you need to do a scaled down version of the event. I didn't want to cancel the event, I didn't want to postpone the event and I really thought the only option was to scale down the event. So this was one of the most highly stressful times in my life. I was relying on a lot of people who were not able to help for whatever reason and um, there was a lot that was sort of put on myself and another one of my star volunteers, Taisha. And we, I decided, along with Darush, that we'd have to scale down the event and this became Green Earth Day. This second festival, Green Earth Day, was held at Windsor, um, a suburb in Brisbane, at the Albion Peace Centre. And it's a hall that we used a lot for a lot of our events like our bake sales, our princess and pirates days, our nutrition events, our video screenings that we had done um, before the first festival to raise money for the event and just raise awareness and promote the event. So it was a really great haul, it's really cheap to hire and it was really good to utilise the overpass instead of having to hire my keys and all things like that. So it was it was a bit left of centre. It was a bit hard to move from something that was such a massive scale and such a massive event and so popular and so well um, spoken of, um, but it was still a really good success. And, and honestly, if we didn't have Green Earth Festival to compare Green Earth Day to. It's, it was still would have been a resounding success. And we had 2,000 people there. We had a lot of people have a great time. We also had a lot of our volunteers involved or some new ones. And um, it, was, it, it was a great event. I was just totally burned out by them. And um, the one positive thing, we actually made money from this one. So that is always a blessing. And um, it was really cool. It was a really great event. However, over the course of that last year, I'd been completely exhausted and completely burned out. And um, I ended up going to New South Wales, Mullumbimby, and a few sort of areas around. Um, I was hanging out with my friend Jody and I, sh I had a friend, Darren, who used to run the Cariad Animal Sanctuary. Um, he shaved my head and I was able to let go of a lot of stuff. I really let go of all the weight I was carrying. I had some love and heartbreak things that were happening around that time too. So it was a really great... Uh, so it was a really great way to physically let go of old, dead sort of stuff. And um, it, was, it was actually really um, unusual. March 2011 is when I noticed a lot of um, long-term vegans start to realize that what they were doing was a lot of work and maybe they couldn't do it as much anymore or maybe they need to take some time out and an example is Sienna from Vegan Voice which was this amazing vegan magazine that was printed for 10 I think it was eight or ten years and um, yeah it was Sienna and myself and a couple of other people I knew we were all having sort of these big 
oh my gosh, do we really need to be doing this sort of thing anymore? So, around this time was a really, really hard part in my life. And I really wish I had one of my friends give me advice. And it was something along the lines of, cost you need to do a cost-benefit analysis of this. Um, and that snapped me out of it. I need, I need someone to say sometimes, hey, rah, rah, rah. Instead of people were saying, oh, it'll be fine. Pray to the angels, do this, do that. Which, you know, was fine maybe six months ago. But when it was down to the wire, those things just didn't work anymore. So I wish I knew of this term called the sunk cost effect. And this is something I've been learning, I'd learned in psychology just recently. And so it means when you continue to invest with something, when you've put so much time or energy or money into it, okay? We all think that we think logically and that we make logical decisions. But when we've invested time, when we've invested money, when we've invested our energies, when we've invested all these things into a business, into an idea or even into a person we don't want to let go of it because of, of what we've already put into it so you're always like oh well i put in all this money so i'll just wait because it will make me money or maybe this next thing that i do will will happen or it's going to happen now or yeah i just need to put in a bit more energy and it doesn't actually work that way i wish someone had said to me sunk cost effect and hopefully yeah, you never know, this is shoulda, woulda, couldas, but I would have liked to have thought that I'd like to think that it would have changed my mind somewhat. After this second festival, Green Earth Day, I decided I wasn't going to be able to do any more festivals. And there's, this is throughout the festival, the people who run festivals, you normally have two or three years that um, you can run a festival for. And also, um, it became a bit of a joke. How bad was your festival on a scale from one to shaving your head like Elsie? <laughs> so um, it was it was quite you know you can you can laugh about it now and we all sort of did it at the time. It was pretty full on at the time. So after I decided not to do any more festivals, we worked out what was Green Earth Group going to be then. It had it had orig originally started because I couldn't use anyone else's public liability then I had to create a not-for-profit so I thought okay well we'll do this to do the festival and now we're not doing the festivals what happens then so we decided that this is you know with a group of people who helped me with the not-for-profit like you know the treasurer the secretary and all the other people on the committee and other members uh, we decided that we would have regular smaller events throughout the year instead of the one massive undertaking in March. And um, we did this 2012 and 2013 and it was we had a lot of events. It was really full on the amount of things we did actually. And um, we had video screenings, we had outreach and leafleting, we had letter writing events, we had nutrition and environmental information nights, we had food outreach, we had food cooking, we had bake sales, we had potlucks, we had, we, and we attended a lot of other environmental festivals that had sprung up since um, the Green Earth Festival and we attended them as Green Earth Group as well. And I gave a large amount of talks on the environmental impact of diets and how veganism can help um, at least from the dietary aspect and as well as all my vegan and vegan lifestyle talks that I had been giving for years. We also decided that we were going to create a blog, we were going to run a website that would focus on encouraging um, people to be vegan and be more, um, be more focused on ethical and environmental issues and it was it was good a lot of people wanted to be involved and then they're just like a lot of things there just wasn't enough help from enough people to make things happen and it can't all fall on one person i realized with my work with the not-for-profit that 
everyone has their own version of commitment. Everyone has their own level of 100%. My 100% was to doing this as a full-time job because I had recently quit my job and I had saved some money for travel and to put on my festival so I was able to do that and I, I also didn't have a partner, I didn't have a family, I didn't have children to look after, I didn't have jobs to um, go into town for or to ride on the train for an hour each way, I didn't have anything I was studying for. I had pretty open life that I was able to um, put all my time and energies into something that I really believed was going to help um, educate and encourage people to be better versions of themselves. After the second festival, I went on a six month journey to Southeast Asia. It was really great. I'd never been there before and I'd wanted to for ages and um, it was really cheap. I had a heap of friends who'd been there before to give me tips and I was really looking forward to going there and having a break. Uh, the first week I arrived in Indonesia, I met one of my friends, Chahaya, who um, introduced me to Cindy, who was the president of the Vegetarian Society of Indonesia. And she asked me to speak at all the, these events that were coming up, so I did. And um, that was about that was about half of my time <laughs> that was meant to be relaxing and um, moving on with my life from being involved in vegan events and speaking at vegan things. But honestly, for a while, it just felt like that was just my life and just to sort of give in to it. And um, I always find when I travel you have the space to think you're not as in phys as physically in that space and mentally in that space that you are when you're at home or when you're at work or when you're with someone or something you have that space to detach from it you have that space to see things from afar and i think it's also a, the fact that you're traveling a lot and when i'm traveling i'm either looking out the train or the bus or um, reading a book or you just have a lot of space and time and I, f I find um, tra travel amazing for transformation and this was one of the first times that happened for me and it made me reassess things with green earth and it made me realize that um, it wasn't working, I was doing all the work and it wasn't worth it, it wasn't getting what we sort of needed anymore, which originally was to put on a festival, which we weren't doing. So um, when I came home we had a meeting, no one else wanted to take over and Green Earth Group was disbanded in December 2013. So Green Earth Group um, happened so Green Earth Group ran from 2009 to 2013 and you can have a look on issue issuu.com for um, the free ebook that shares the whole journey over these years and um, it's um, or you just do a internet search for Green Earth Group the history and that should come up as well and there's a lot of stuff in there um, but there's heaps of photos so you can see what the festivals looked like and see all the events we did and fun stuff like that I'm still friends with a heap of people from Green Earth Group some of my best friends are people I met around that time and um, I really really love the fact that it happened and that those people came into my life I was just thinking that I wanted to be around similar people, similar people who had similar mindsets to me and that meant being vegan. I soon realized that just because someone's vegan doesn't mean they're a nice person, doesn't mean they agree with other things that I agree with and um, realized after that I needed to sort of work out who was beneficial or who was a positive influence in my life and who wasn't so that was also another lesson and I learned a lot I learned so many lessons with green earth and in particular about being adaptable 
going with whatever happens. Um, leadership. I re I've always been a leader, but this was a very, very good challenge to show my leadership skills and to be that person that makes the hard decisions and that people can blame and that people can bitch about when things don't go to plan or how they thought or how they expected or how they wished. And I have thick skin and I don't take it personally. And I learned a lot about what I was capable of. I knew that, yep, this didn't happen as, it, as I wanted it to, as it should have, as all the time and energy we put into this should have, um, you know, equated to, I guess. But it was really amazing to be able to go, hey, I can make this happen with a really, really low budget, with creating a tribe, with making people feel passionate and connected and part of the changes that we needed. And that, honestly, still one of my most successful things in my life. Green, Green Earth Group was created to promote a better way of living for us, for our animal friends and for our planet. And we wanted to encourage people to think about their lifestyles, think about their diet, think about what they were doing. And this was really important. It's still really important. And um, I'm glad that we started it, especially in Brisbane. People really didn't think there would be enough of a community in Brisbane 10 years ago, enough of a vegan community, enough people who would even care about environmental stuff to make it happen. And it happened. It really did. And it was great. The past two years I've been studying, I've been doing my Bachelor of Psychology Honours and I decided after another travel as transformation trip, this time to Europe and the UK, that I needed to stop doing all the vegan stuff and the volunteer work and activism I'd been doing for a couple of decades. I um, have I've done a video about that. Um, it's called What Would You Be Doing If The World Was Already Vegan? And um, you can have a look at that on my YouTube channel. And that all came about when I was running, when I was the president of the Vegetarian Vegan Society of Queensland and a friend, Alex from the Vegetarian Guides, he asked me that question. It totally blew my mind. It totally started my transformation. And um, yeah, check out that video if you haven't seen it before. So because of that, long story short, that led me to realize I needed to do things for myself that were good for me and that would set me up financially instead of putting all my time and energy and money into promoting veganism. And that's why I'd started Viva La Vegan in 2005 as well, because um, I believed that we needed to promote veganism because people didn't know about it. They didn't even know how to pronounce the word. I've been vegan now for 24 years and there's a lot that's changed since then. And um, over the past years I've been at uni, I've taken a step back from the vegan scene because it's a lot different than when I first was involved and when I enjoyed being involved in it. My passion now is cyber psychology, how we're interacting with technology and devices and machines. And um, I'm really interested in people making conscious decisions and mindful decisions about how they use all these things. And uh, this year I'm doing honours. It's taken a lot of work and dedication to get there. Um, I've got a GPA of six out of seven, which means I'm in the top 15 or, or even less of my university. Um, at Honours now there's 30 of us and we started with 1,000 people so you can sort of see the commitment it took to get to that level. It's not 100% confirmed but my thesis this year for my Honours is something around social robots and the difference between how robots interact with children and how humans interact with children in an early learning setting. 
and um, that's my focus and it'll be another hard nine months. I'm not sure if I'm doing my PhD yet and I just have to weigh up the pros and cons. Since I've been away from the vegan scene, I've been able to see things from afar. I've been able to um, see the positive things and the negative things and um, it's been really good. It's been eye-opening. It's been really good to see that you can still be effective by leading by example and just showing up and just having constant constancy I guess in your life in the way you act in the way you make decisions in the way you influence other people 24 years ago veganism was really supportive we helped out each other there weren't many vegans around so when you met someone they were your friend you loved them no matter how weird they were or some other quirky traits they might have had. Yeah, there was people who didn't like each other, but there was no real massive fights. You just didn't deal with those people. Um, now, veganism and the animal rights scene is very competitive. There's only ever going to be a limited amount of people who care about animals, who care about veganism, who care about the things that we sort of care about. And then there's a lot more people that are competing for that space. You know, when you go to vegan events now, it's not vegan people or animal rights people or activists that are there. It's whatever some brand is now that wants to capitalize on the vegan trend and just adds, you know, vegan or halal or gluten free onto one of their products or, you know, just wants to put the word vegan on a t shirt that's made in China and made by slave wages. It's really, really sad to see how things have happened and how things have gone in a negative way. Um, people used to want to be involved to promote veganism. That was it. You, you, would do, you would do things because you believed in the cause. You believed in the fact that people needed to know that animals have feelings. Animals want to live as much as we do. And um, we all should be looking after people and other um, animals that need the, our protection instead of using and abusing animals and people on the planet like a lot of other people do. Um, nowadays, people know what veganism is. I don't think it needs to be promoted as much now. So what do we do? Where do we go forward? And I really think we all need to have some, you know, some of us long-term vegans who've seen how things come in and wax and wane throughout the decades need to really sit, sit down and have a honest discussion um, that's remove, that has emotions removed, that just sees the black and white that has the stats to back it up, has the actual effective, um, tangible aspects, not just the abstract things that people think are beneficial, and to all come together and work out where we need to go for the future. It's really a pivotal time at the moment, especially as Australia last year was just all fires and floods again. Where um, we're still not doing everything we need to, we still have a long way to go, especially in Queensland, which is seen politically as a, maybe a bit of a backward state. We have a massive land, we have a massive amount of land in Queensland. We have a lot of different people who live here, and we need to be able to listen to different types of people who don't agree with us. We need to be able to have rational conversations and like any relationship, like any communication, what am I getting from you and what am I giving to you and how can we make it a bit more balanced instead of it always being you're wrong, I'm right, full stop, I don't want to speak to you, I don't want anything to do with you, let's part ways. And if you think about the things that have happened in the past, say, five to ten years, a lot of the negative things have come from how we've interacted with people online, how online interaction has filtered out into our everyday life. If you think about Facebook, for example, Facebook has encouraged people to share things that give them a more interaction. They don't want people to share long form, 
paragraph, more than a paragraph, long reads, anything like that anymore. They want short, sharp, to the point, uh, really outrage, emotive sort of stuff that you can just read a meme, a meme, a video, an image. That's what have we have been encouraged to produce. That's what we have been encouraged by their algorithms to be seen more and for people to interact with more. And we've fallen for it. We've been told you need to pay money to, so that your things get seen. We don't understand the algorithms. We don't understand where the money is going from for the advertising, but we do it. We pay it anyway because we want to be involved and we have to be involved because most people are on Facebook. But all these things have really affected us as a society and all of these things have really affected us as a vegan community and an animal rights community. We need to be able to have better conversations. We need to be able to do more effective activism and more effective things that go beyond promoting veganism. It's how do we move forward as a group? How do we actually get effective things done? And I'm not talking about posting a half naked selfie. I'm not talking about doing something just so you can share it online. I'm not talking about raising money to fund something that's just primarily for you. I'm not talking about raising money and things like that for a person. I'm talking about how everyone in the movement can work together to make things happen. Or we can promote groups that are already doing some great things. The Vegan Society of the UK does some really amazing things and um, one of the examples is they help farmers who want to move into vegan products so they have dairies to berries that might be in the UK actually um, Dr Michael Gregor has talked about that. There's things like that where animal agriculture, animal um, products and secretions are really not cost effective anymore for our planets, for our bodies and obviously for the animals. So how do we move to a better way of thinking, a better way of acting and a better way of influencing people? We need to work with farmers who are willing to make these changes and to promote them and to protect them. At the moment in Australia and in a lot of other countries, the the dairy and the meat industries are heavily subsidized by the governments. These needs, these subsidies need to go into things that are promoting transitions, promoting things. This is a better way of putting your time and energy and money into something than this used to be. A lot of farmers, their children or their grandchildren no longer want to do the job. It's hard, hard work. We need farmers, we need people to make us food and we need to be supporting them in the best way that we can. Obviously, I would love if there was more farmers who were creating vegan products and this would be a great way to put money into going forward. Our government at the moment just really doesn't see the need in promoting anything that's helpful to climate, a climate change and anything like that. It's really interesting how more people care about the environment, who care about veganism or animal rights now, but just creating a movement or just creating momentum isn't enough. And even someone like Greta Thunberg will say to you that, yeah, she's been getting people coming to events and coming and doing protests and more people are going vegan and stuff. But who the people that need to make the big decisions to make the massive changes happen are still not doing it. That's our governments, that's our leaders, that's people like that who need to do it. So what do we do? And I don't know the answer. I don't have the answers. But we need to be really effective with our time and with our energies and we need to be able to have these discussions and not just bring it down to, oh, we're going to listen to him because he's got a heap more followers and we're going to listen to him because, you know, he gets so many likes because he's just, you know, saying all this negative stuff about everyone else in the movement. We need to listen to the people that don't speak up, that are actually behind the scenes doing stuff all the time and a lot of these people are women who are used to doing a lot of things and not getting paid for it. It's the way our society is at the moment. We don't value a lot of these things. We don't value things that are normally seen as women's jobs like you know compassionate roles, prote um, 
like compassionate roles, looking after people, looking after children, looking after family members, jobs that are real are not are jobs that are necessary but not necessarily paid well. And teachers, um, police, nurses, all that sort of stuff. We need to change our mindset of what's valued and people that are doing this work. And we also need to not just say, hey, veganism's great. There's so many vegans in the world now because there's a lot more people who are eating a vegan diet. There's a lot more people who are eating a plant-based diet. There's a lot of more people who are flexitarian, which means they're vegan here, vegetarian there, might eat some meat here and there. But there's not that many people who agree with the fundamental aspects of veganism and animal rights. And these are that animals have the same amount of rights that we do as humans. And until we see that as, as anything different, and I'm talking about global ideas or a large group of people that can influence the majority, until these things are seen as important, it's not going to, it's not going to matter much. And I also think that it's great that we have all these vegan products, it's great we have so many vegan options, but a lot of vegan businesses are really struggling. There's so many vegan, vegan I'm talking people who are ethical vegans who've had to close businesses because the influx of vegan products is coming at the expense of vegan products and vegan businesses okay and I personally don't think when we're seeing vegan products and vegan stuff as a positive that we can really move anywhere forward other than just for buying, consumerism, and capitalism. They're the things at the moment we need to move forward. And if we as vegans of animal rights are still basing our um, movement going forward on these things that are really negative in the world, how can we really move forward? How can we make these things happen? I really think we need to collaborate more. One of you can see some really good information that some vegan charities have done and some vegan groups have done that shows what's actually effective out there. There's not enough vegans, people haven't been vegan for that long to be able to do really good studies like longitudinal studies which means over time and um, we really need this sort of data to see what is the actual impact of a lot of things that we say is effective. One of the most effective things, if not the most effective thing, is to give money to charities, to give money to animal sanctuaries, and to give money to not-for-profits. This is the most effective thing that you can do as a person, as a vegan, as an activist. There's a lot of other stuff you might like doing. There's a lot of other stuff that might give you a lot of clout online. There's a lot of other stuff that might like, that might get all those cute boys or those cute girls to look at you more. But the most effective thing you can do is put your money towards groups that already exist, to groups that are doing something amazing and help them out. There's only so much time, there's only so much energy, there's only so much money, and there's only so many things that we can put our time and energies towards. We're interacting in a way that goes against what we need to do as a society. We are putting more emphasis on engagement and superficiality. We're forgetting deep learning, we're forgetting about critical thinking, and we're forgetting about engaging with people in one-on-one, -on -one, establishing, establishing relationships and making relationships thrive. We can do better, and I know that we can all do better, and I hope that um, you can give some ideas that you're also willing to step up and do. And I hope as a society, and I hope as a vegan movement and an animal rights movement, that we can really start these sort of discussions on how we can move things forward. And it's not about these people are wrong, these people are right, I like this, or I went vegan because of this, therefore, this is the way I'm going to get other people to go vegan. It's not about converting people, it's about encouraging people and educating people. But then what do we do? What's the next step? People already know about veganism, where do we go from there? How can we really, really make 
the changes that are necessary in our society happen and how can we make it happen when we're working collectively and collaboratively together. Thank you for listening. I hope you got something out of that. As I mentioned before, if you want to see all the photos from Green Earth Group and Green Earth Festival and Green Earth Day um, and all the events and all the outreach and all the activism and every single thing else that we did for from 2009 to 2013, have a look at that. You can have a look at issue or just do an internet search for Green Earth Group The History. You can also have a look at my website, vivalavegan.net. I don't really update it much now. As I said, um, my, I, my focus is on um, honours this year and on cyber psychology, but it's an archival site for a lot of vegan and animal rights information since 2005, before veganism was on trend and before people said for the animals because it was just a given back then. Anyway, I'm Lee Chantel. Thank you so much for paying attention. I'm on Twitter, I'm on YouTube, and I begrudgingly have a Facebook page. Other than that, I hope to see you in person and have a wonderful year. I'd love to hear what you've been up to. Thank you.